I want to know how many people in here would consider themselves romantics. You're a romantic. You like romance. Now, all right, we got a couple who are willing to admit it. When, when I was in high school, I was quite the romantic. I'll admit it. I used to write love songs. That's right. I would wait till my girlfriend was at work, and then I would go put like a little note under her windshield wiper so that when she came out, she would read it. I would write poetry, which is thankfully lost to history. And before, I, you might think that's like a little bit pathetic or... You might think, you know, that that's desperate, but let me tell you something. I believe this with all my heart. Any man that has taken a good hard look in the mirror, like a really good hard look in the mirror, there should be a level of desperation in our hearts when it comes to dating. And for me in high school, I knew that I was out of my league when it came to the girl that I was talking to, Jarrah Craycraft. I knew I was punching above my weight and I relate everything to football. I thought that I was the 2007 Boise State team that somehow made it to the Fiesta Bowl against Oklahoma. No business being in this game, but they were gonna pull out all the tricks and all the stops, just anything that they could do. Hey, I'm there, so I'm gonna try. And that's kind of how I viewed my, my romantic chances. And let me tell you something, 43 to 42, That was the score, Boise State. Upsets do happen, and I'm living proof myself after almost 16 years of marriage. So guys, just shoot your shot, all right? If there's a girl, go for it. You never know. I'm talking about romance because it sells in our culture. And if you don't believe me, just look at the fact that the TV show The Bachelor has been on for 27 seasons, It was so successful that it spawned another show called The Bachelorette, 20 seasons. Last year, they even tried like a geriatric bachelor. I don't know if anybody's watching it, but they're trying it. If there is is something that our society, like TV execs, they know we like shows about love and we like shows about like people trapped on islands. And they've just combined them all now. Now everybody's looking for love while they're trapped on an island. We are obsessed with love. We're obsessed with romance. The Greek word for that type of love is eros. Can you say that? Eros. Eros is a romantic, passionate type of love. But that's not the only Greek word for love that we see in the New Testament. In fact, there's four different Greek words that are all translated into English as love. There's eros, which we talked about. There's phila. Phila, if you're ever wondering, that's like a brotherly love, a warm affection between friends. If you're trying to remember, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. There's also storgi, that's a different Greek word, and that has to do with a parent's love for their children, okay, kind of like siblings loving each other. So we've got eros, and we've got philia, we've got storgi, and we've got agape, Agape love is different from those other types of love in that it is a self-sacrificial type of love. Agape love is the type of love that considers someone else's needs as more important than my own. It is a love that's motivated to action. Agape love, if you read C.S. Lewis's book, The Four Loves, and it's a short read, so you could pick that up and read it. It talks about these four different Uh, types of love that the New Testament talks about. He says that agape love is the king of all types of love. Agape love is the type of love that informs how phila and eros and storgi are supposed to happen. It all comes from agape love. Now we're talking about love because you you could say that 1 John is a book of love. You really could. It's just a couple of pages in your Bible. If you ever open it up and just read it front to back, I mean, it's like two pages, and yet the word love is mentioned 46 different times in this one small book, 46 times. And out of all of those times that love is mentioned, it is agape love every single time. And so today, as we go back again to this topic of love, this is his third discourse on love in the letter to 1 John. We are looking at this idea of agape love. Let's read 1 John 4, 7 through 11, one more time here. Beloved, let us love one another, 
For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Remember, this is agape love. Anyone who does not love doesn't know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. This is God's word to us. Now let's read a little bit more about love. Let's talk a little bit more about this type of agape love. Now we've talked like I said, this is the third different time that John is bringing this topic up. We've already said this whole letter is symphonic in nature. Do you remember us talking about that? There are themes that keep coming back up and up. There's melodies that repeat. This is his third discourse on love. The first one happened in 1 John chapter 2. In 1 John chapter 2, we're going to read verses 9 and 10. Here's what it says. Whoever says that he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. So agape love, self-sacrificial, you're going to hear me say this all the time, self-sacrificial, others over self, motivated to action, love is a result of abiding with God, walking with God walking in light and not darkness. It's fellowship. The idea is that if I am walking with God, if I have fellowship with God, then agape love is going to be the result. That's discourse number one. Now, the second time he brings it up is in chapter three. In chapter three, verse, we're gonna read verses 10 and verses 18. And this isn't talking about fellowship. This is talking about sonship. Here's what we read in chapter three, verse 10. By this, it is evident who are the children of God, who are the sons and daughters of God, and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not agape his brother. Verse 18, little children, let us not love in word or in talk, but in deed and in truth. So now in his second discourse, John says, that if you are a child of God, if you have been born of God, born again, not of flesh and blood, but born of spirit, now as a result of this, agape will be your lifestyle. You will love your brother. If you are a child of God, love that is motivated to action will be a part of your life. So we see that fellowship with God results in this type of love overflowing out of my life sonship with God. To be a child of God means that this overflows out of my life. And now in this third discourse, it's almost like he's, he is tracing the streams all the way back to their very source. And he makes this really strong declaration in 1 John 4, 8, where he says this, all of this is true because God is love. God is love. If you're taking notes today, this is, this is something I want you to write down. Pull out your phone, pull out a notebook, and write down that phrase, God is love. Now, I think that it makes sense for us to spend a little bit of time on this idea. I think that we really need to explore it just like any other attribute or characteristic of God. God is love, John says. It's not simply that God loves, it's that God is love. It's a part of his nature. It's a part of his character. It's a part of his person. This is different. Now, here's where we need to sort of walk this tightrope, okay? We can fall off on, on either side, but we need to really dig in so that we understand what this means. When I say, when John says, when God reveals himself and says that he is love, what this means is that love is not merely something that God does. I think we hear God is love and we think God is loving or God loves, but it's a deeper and more profound statement than that. 
Love is not merely something that God does in the way that we do it. We choose to love. We make a decision to love, but that's not what it's talking about. He's saying it's bigger than that. God is love. I tried to find a good illustration or an example to help us to understand this, and I don't know that I ever came up with one, but we'll try, okay? I want you to picture the sun. For me, it's easy because I'm staring into these lights up here, but for you, you're in a dark theater. Picture the sun hanging in the sky. There's a lot of different ways that you could describe the sun. It is a star. It's a a heavenly body. The sun is a burning ball of gas, right? It's light and it's heat. And if all of those things are removed, then it's no longer the sun. If the sun is not burning, if it's not hanging in the sky, if there's no light or heat, then it's not, it ceases to be the sun as we know it. Does this make sense? And in the same way that light emits or it comes out of the sun as a part of its very nature, love comes out of God, not as something that he does, but as a part of who he is. He is the source of this love. And in verse seven, we see that John is combining all of his other discourses on love so far. He says, beloved, let us love one another for love is from God. And whoever loves has been two things. They've been born of God and they know God. This goes back to sonship and fellowship. You know God, you're walking with him. You've been born of God, you're a child of God. And so you will agape love. He states those things. And then he flips it over and he restates it in the negative. So if you don't know love, that means you don't know God because God is love. And so for us, if we are children of God who are walking with God, what should come out of that is agape love because we have the DNA, we have the characteristics of our father in heaven. It is a part of who I am. I love, not because I'm generating this love from within myself, not because I'm always just fighting to love. I love because it is who God has created me to be. It's a piece of him. It's a part of him. And if that is missing from you as as a believer, then you are missing an essential part of what it means to be a child of God. Now, I'm no scientist, Okay, I actually wasn't even very good at science, but I remember some things from like high school science classes. And when you're just classifying animals, right? So a mammal, some of you are gonna help me out on this after, but a mammal, right? A mammal is warm-blooded. A mammal has fur or hair. A mammal gives birth to live young. These are the, these are the attributes that make it a mammal, Right? A reptile is going to be cold-blooded. A, uh, a bird has feathers. A fish has gills. All of these things are attributes that make that thing the thing. So if you were to come up to me and you were to say, hey, I found a mammal that has feathers and is cold-blooded, I would say, that's not a mammal. It doesn't have the necessary characteristics that make it what it is. And if you're to tell me, hey, I'm a Christian, but I actually have no desire to agape, love other people in a way that is self-sacrificial, others over self and action oriented, then I would say you are missing an essential characteristic of what it means to be a son or a daughter of the king. You're missing the attribute. And so you have to understand it goes beyond this idea that God is loving or that God chooses to love. God is love. That's bigger That's a deeper thing. It has a profound impact. Love is not merely something that God does. Now, once again, we we find ourselves in danger of falling off on the other side of this because you might hear that God is love and you might latch on to that idea. I know that that's a popular thing in our culture. God is love. But just because 1 John 4, 8 says that God is love, that does not mean that love is the only thing that God is. To define one characteristic is not to remove the others. Love isn't the only thing that God is. 
When John reveals this about God, that doesn't cancel out God's holiness or God's perfection or his righteousness or his justice. All of these pieces and parts that God reveals himself in these pieces and parts all throughout scripture, they are all true and they all work together in unison. But man, we live in a culture that likes to pick and choose the attributes of God that we like and we discard the ones we don't. So we might say, man, I love the forgiveness of God, but I sure don't like these, these, this list of things that God says are sinful. I'm going to say, I like this. I don't like that. I'm going to pick this. I'm leaving that off to the side. I love that God that says that he's patient and long suffering. I really don't like the God that uh, says he's going to judge. My friends, the same God that that is revealing himself in 1 John 4, 8 by saying God is love, is the same God in Revelation that will come back riding on a white horse. And on his thigh is gonna be tattooed the, the phrase, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he's gonna be wearing a white robe dipped in blood. A sword will proceed from his mouth from which he will judge the nations. Those who are wicked and evil will receive justice and the world will be purged from sin. God is both of those things at the same time. And if you actually just, if you actually just look at 1 John 4.10, you can see God's, God's different characteristics working together in perfect unison. 1 John 4.10 says this, in this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now we have talked about propitiation before, but I'll just give you a refresher. When you think propitiation, you just need to think a payment that satisfies a debt. And what we read here is that Jesus came to satisfy a debt God sent us his son to be the payment that satisfies the debt for what? It says for our sin. Now, let me just tell you something. If God is not morally perfect and holy and righteous, there is no such thing as sin. Everything is permissible. It's all just a matter of your perspective in the moment. But because God is holy and God is righteous, there is such a thing as sin. Now, if God was, if you were to say God is holy, but that he can just tolerate sin, I would say, well, then he's not holy. If you were to say to me that God is righteous, but he can just look the other way when it comes to evil and wrongdoing, then I would say, well, that's not righteousness. If you were to tell me that God is just, but that he just allows people who rape and murder and lie and cheat and steal, to get away with it, I would say, where's the justice in that? But in this, we see that a payment is demanded for what? For our sin. Because we have sinned, because we have lied and cheated and, and stolen, because we are proud and greedy, and because God is righteous and holy, those things cannot simply be allowed to exist or pass. But God's perfection, his holiness, his righteousness meets his love in the person of Jesus Christ. God loved us so much that he sent his only son to satisfy that debt payment for sin, not that he had accrued, but the one that we owed. You see, just because God is love, that doesn't mean that his other attributes are, are null and void. God will still judge sin but he loves us enough that even though we are trapped in our sin and unable to do anything about it, God came and he did something about it on our behalf. He self-sacrificially, others over self, action-oriented loved us so much that he did something about it. Praise God. We cannot be a people that simply just pick and choose how we want to define God, the attributes we like and don't like. I might regret this, but there's, there's a movie called Talladega Nights. I am not recommending it. Okay, this is not an endorsement. I just think some of y'all have seen it. And by, 
by that laugh, I think I'm probably right. There's, there's a moment in this movie where the main character, Ricky Bobby, is sitting around a, a dinner table with his whole family. And he's praying a prayer of blessing over his food. And the only weird thing about it, there's a lot of weird things, but the, the weirdest thing is he keeps praying to the little Lord baby Jesus. Little Lord baby Jesus, I thank you for this food. Little Lord baby Jesus, thank you for all my blessings. Little tiny infant Jesus. And then his wife finally just interrupts him and says, Ricky, it's a little weird that you're praying to the baby Jesus. He grew up, he was a man. And Ricky says, when it's your turn to say the blessing, you can pray to teenage Jesus or grown up Jesus, whichever one you want. I like the little baby Christmas Jesus the best. And that just starts this whole conversation of how everybody likes to picture Jesus. Well, I like Jesus this way. And I think of Jesus this, man, we do that. I know it's irreverent and I know that it's, uh, it's supposed to be funny, but it's really not that far off of the truth. That person, yeah, Jesus is gonna judge their sin. This person, God is love. God has revealed himself the way that he has revealed himself. We don't get to mess with that definition. God himself is the one who defines what is loving. Why does God define what is loving? Because God is love. It's not simply that love is something that God does. It is who he is. When you see self-sacrificial, agape love, others over self, action-oriented, where does that exist in the world? It exists from God as its source. Without God, there is not that type of love. You must understand that. We don't generate that. That doesn't exist in the world without God. That is, he is love. God defines what is loving. And it is so arrogant of us to think otherwise that we get to define what is loving. Man, just because we say something is love, just because we call it love, that doesn't mean it's actually love. It's nonsense. How do I know what love is? Well, God defines it. He says so in verse nine, he says, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us. That word manifest, it appeared, it was visible. Do you wanna know what love is? It's not a philosophical idea. It's not an abstract context. There's no definition. Outside of this, Love was made manifest among us, Jesus Christ. Do you want to know what agape love is? Look to Jesus. He is love. Do you want to know what that looks like lived out? Look to Jesus. Love became manifest. John, John says in, in the very first lines of this book, he says, that which we have seen, and we've, we've seen it, we've heard it, we've touched him, we lived with him. Love became manifest. God appeared. And so now we don't get to define love however we want to define love. It's become such a popular phrase in our day and age, love is love. You know what that means, don't you? It means I get to define love however I want to define love. Love is love. That's not meant to help you clarify what true love is. That's meant to stop a conversation. I don't know about you guys, but I learned in about third grade, if you use the word in the definition, then it's not really a definition. Blue is blue. Big is big. It's nonsense. It makes no sense. But for us as believers, we actually have substance that we can offer to the world. We have a definition of love. Love has a name. We can look to the cross and we can see the love of God made manifest in this world. A love that caused him to go from heaven to earth. A love that forgives not his debts, but my debts. He takes them on himself. We can see love in his nail scarred hands. We can see love in the strips of flesh torn from his back, we see love evident and manifest, self-sacrificial. Others over self, love motivated to action. That's Jesus Christ. Love has a name. And now we see in verse 11, man, I wish I had more time. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. 
Man, what a statement. I sometimes feel like, God, you're holding me to a high. (laughs) Hey, if Jesus did it, you should do it. That is easier said than done. Let me tell you that right now. I want you to imagine that you and I are going to the gym together. It would require both of us probably being more motivated than we are now, but we're going to imagine it, okay? And we go to the gym together, and you forgot your water bottle. Now, this is a perfect opportunity for me to to show agape love to you. I have some water, and I can, you're thirsty, and I'm going to help you out. Self-sacrificial, it's motivating me to action. And we're working out, and, and, you know, I'm going to let you drink my water. Don't put your mouth on it. All right, that's weird. But you're drinking the water. We're working out. And I'm realizing pretty quick, like, you're a thirsty fella. And I'm sweating too here. And I'm watching this water just slowly drain out. Well, it's draining faster and faster. And there comes a moment where, like, I know there's more workout than water left. And I just want to yell, like, enough. You've had enough. I can't give you any more. I think that this is how so many of us view our responsibility to love like Christ loved. I need to motivate from within. I need to generate this love from within myself that I can give to you. I need to try harder. I need to do better. I need to just suck it up and give, 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 give. And there may be an element of that that is true, but I've watched person after person who has signed up to serve, who has signed up to lead small groups, who is signed up to give and they give and they realize pretty quickly, man, people need a lot more. There's a lot of thirsty people out here and I'm running out until eventually you just say enough. I can't serve anymore. I'm done. I know I said I would give to this building campaign or I can't, I'm done. Now, I want you to see this in verse nine. Sorry. (laughs) At the end of verse nine, it says this, in this, the love of God was made manifest. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Now there's two meanings there that I see. The first one is obvious, like we might have true eternal life through Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. But there's also the truth that we're no longer meant to live on our own and in our own strength and in our own power, but we're meant to live through him. We're meant to live through Christ. I want you to imagine that same story, me and you at the gym, but one variable is changed. You see in the back of the gym by the bathrooms is a drinking fountain. And at any point during this workout, I can just go back and fill up my water bottle. So many of us are trying to work and and serve and love out of our own, out of our own ability. When the reality is that God is love, he is also the source of love. He is a never ending source of love. And you don't have to wait till Sunday morning. You don't have to wait till church camp or a Brandon Lake concert in order to fill back up with that love, to be motivated. You can do it each and every day, going to God and saying, God, give me enough to give back out today. Give me enough. Be that source of love. And it doesn't have to be big and it doesn't have to be grand and it doesn't have to be spectacular. Most of the time, here's what it is. It's me and God's word. Maybe a worship song, maybe a psalm, a time of prayer. Lord, fill me with your love. I know that in myself, I I can't do it. I can't generate it. Be the source of love that I need. God, Fill me with your love so that I might love others with this same agape, self-sacrificial, others over self, motivated to action type of love that you say you've put in my DNA as your child. My friends, God is love. It's not merely something that he does. It's not the only thing that he is. This love that God has shown to us, it's made manifest, it's manifest. We've, we've seen it. We don't define it however we wanna define it. We look to Jesus Christ for that definition. 
And now God calls me, he calls you as his children to love in the same way that he did. And in our own strength and power, that is impossible. But God is not just love, he is the source of love. And if we live through him and through his power, man, it is a source that is everlasting. It is a spring that wells up within me continually, never runs out, never runs dry. I never have to yell enough. I just have to say, God, I need more. God, give me more. Would you pray with me today? God, I thank you for revealing yourself in such fullness in your word. God, your word cuts me. It is living, it is active, it is sharp. It cuts through all of my fleshly, Lord, rebellion. It cuts through my own attempts at redefining things and it just shows me truth. Thank you for it. Lord, I know that today a line has been drawn. Your word tells us, God, that if we do not show in our own hearts, in our own lives, a self-sacrificial agape love, a desire to love others in that way, Lord, then we cannot rest assured that we are your children who are walking and abiding with you because that's a result. We want to love like you. So Lord, we once again, just bow our hearts in submission to you. Lord, we confess the ways in which we have been selfish and self-centered. Lord, we ask you to fill us once again, day by day with your love, to be that source for us that allows us to love in the way that you loved, Jesus. Not in words, not with talk, but in deed and in truth. I pray for this church body, Lord, that this together, I, I know that together, Lord, if we are all tapping into that source of love, if we're tapping into you, God, then this place will be a well. Lord, an oasis in a dry and thirsty land where people can come and drink freely from the water of life. And that is my desire. May this be a place where people find truth and life. We worship you and love you. There is no one like you. There's no one in front of you or above you or before you. You are worthy of all glory, honor, power, and praise now and forevermore. And we raise our voices to you. We love you. And we ask all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.